shapely legs, slashed skirts, outrageous necklines, and a monarch who dismissed male courtiers failing his exacting standards of fashionable dress. The nine full-length family portraits by William Larkin in the Suffolk Collection, a testament to the excesses of the court of King James I. They tell the tale of a world of intrigue, masquerade, poisonings, dueling, and high fashion in the second decade of the 17th century. Examples of 17th century clothing are rare, particularly examples of female clothing, in fact. A study of dress relies either on surviving garments, documents such as inventories, journals, or letters, and images, paintings and drawings. Moreover, individual garments don't reveal the complex assemblages of underwear, outer garments, and accessories that comprise the complete outfit. Thus, the portraits attributed to William Larkin in the Suffolk Collection are a rich source of information for costume historians. The formal outfits in Larkin's full-end portraits are an ostentatious display of wealth, costumes for grand gala occasions, for public display, costumes for the dandies and fashionistas of the Jacobean age, these dedicated followers of fashion. The court of King James I of England, sixth of Scotland, who reigned from 1603 to 1625, was notorious for its laxity, drunkenness, and promiscuity. Fashionable attire was essential. Our own Thomas Howard, first Earl of Suffolk, advised an aspiring courtier that the king doth admire good fashion in clothes and proceeded to give him a very detailed description of the style of jerking and rough required. Just four years into the reign of James I, 18 courtiers had already been dismissed for not meeting the king's exacting standards of taste in male attire. And if you've been reading Hilary Mantel during this period of lockdown, the family names of the sitters in the portraits we should be looking at would be very familiar to you. Cecil, Howard, Rich, Sackville and Carey. The Suffolk collection contains nine full-length portraits by William Mark and eight in the upper hall. They're family portraits that once belongs, belonged to the Earls of Suffolk and Berkshire whose family seat was Charlton Park in Wiltshire. The portraits are of particular importance and interest because so many have remained together and because the sitters, as I said, are predominantly female. Seven are female, two are male. The seven female portraits are known collectively as the Berkshire marriage set. They were bequeathed to the nation by the 19th Countess of Suffolk in 1974, as you know, she was an American heiress called Daisy Leiter, who had married into the English aristocracy and whose full-length portrait by the American artist John Singer Sargent hangs in Lord Mansfield's bedroom. No documentary evidence survives as to why they were commissioned, but the assumption is that the occasion was a major family event such as a wedding. Interestingly, when they were first acquired for the nation, the paintings were brought to Kenwood House for inspection and cataloguing before being hung in Ranger's House in Blackheath, where the collection remained for 30 years until 2002 when it returned to Kenwood House. It came into the care of English Heritage in 1986 and the paintings were cleaned and restored in the 1980s and 1990s. William Larkin was born in London sometime in the 1580s and was active for a decade between 1609 and his early death in 1619. And this is a map of London from 1600, so during the time that Larkin lived here. His father was a prosperous innkeeper, managing the Rose Inn, which stood where Hope and Viaduct Bridge stands today. So if we zoom in on that, 
you will see that the inn stood near the point where the Fleet River is channeled underground in community near the Thames at Blackfriars. Larkin was married sometime before 1612 and buried a stillborn son William, named after himself, in 1613, and a daughter, Mary, the following year. A second daughter, also called Mary after her mother, did survive infancy and is named in his will. I'm grateful for the detailed research and transcription of Larkin's will in the London Metropolitan Archives by fellow volunteer in Chapman. Thank you. Larkin died sometime between the witnessing of his will, in which he describes himself as being weak and sick of body, but of good and perfect mind, which was on the 10th of April. 1619 and its proving on the 14th of May 1619. Last year, 2019, was the 400th anniversary of Larkin's death, but regrettably this important anniversary wasn't marked at Kenwood House because it coincided with the 350th anniversary of Rembrandt's death. Little is known about Larkin's studio, but current research suggests that he belonged to a group of painters and craftspeople who lived and worked in and around Holborn during the reign of James I. Larkin's father was a close neighbour of the artist Robert Peake, portrait painter to Henry, Prince of Wales, and Peake may have introduced the young Larkin to painting. The exhibition of portrait miniatures at the National Portrait Gallery in 2019, however, seemed to suggest that his teacher may have been the miniaturist Isaac Oliver, a contemporary of Nicholas Hilliard, but no evidence of Larkin's training has survived. However, extant records show that he became a member of the Worshipful Company of Painter Stainers in 1606, when he was in his early 20s and that he owed his freedom of the City of London to two aristocrats, Edward Seymour, Earl of Hertford, and Lady Arabella Stuart. As a freeman, he was allowed to employ assistants, including foreigners. His patrons, as we see at Kenwood, were predominantly courtiers, or from the aristocracy, and unusually predominantly female as I said, but he never had royal patronage. Before the Suffolk collection paintings were definitively attributed to Larkin in the 1990s by art historian Sir Roy Strong, the maker of these portraits was known only as the Curtain Master, and his works were referred to for obvious reasons as the Curtain and Carpet Pictures. Larkin's extant verb after reattribution comprises 39 paintings, 28 full-length portraits on canvas, of which nine were at Kenwood, and 11 head and shoulders on wooden panels. Kenwood houses the most extensive collection of his work anywhere. As you can see from these six examples, William Larkin's full-length portraits in the self collection are characterized by identically draped, fringed, metallically rendered curtains that frame the sitter, painted in various colors, red being a high status color. Full-length portraits were costly and compel the viewer to look up at the face of the sitter reinforcing their superiority and magnificence by conveying their full physical presence. The three-quarter view static poses in all the Kenwood Larkins ensure that as much of the garments as possible is visible, displaying the clothing to its best advantage, if not the sitter. The paintings demonstrate how fabrics, clothes and accessories were instrumental to constructing the status of the sitter through the careful use of pattern, texture, and color. This flat, decorative style would reach a dead end 
with the deaths of Larkin and his contemporary Nicholas Hilliard both in 1619. As the 1620s saw the arrival in England of the Baroque style in painting and dress under the influence of artists like Anthony van Dyck, Rubens and Orazio and Gen uh, Artemisia Gentileschi. Van Dyck stayed in London for a few months in the year immediately following Larkin's death and introduced a new naturalism and subtlety into English portraiture with effects of light and shade, realistic anatomy and drapery, perspective and character. Although the sitter's poses are stiff and conventional, the portrait heads are beautifully painted and more naturalistic, hinting at the changes Baroque artists would soon bring. Larkin, as master painter, would have been responsible for getting commissions, running his studio and making an initial portrait sketch from life at the sitter's residence, particularly of the head in pencil, chalk, ink, or even in Orion paper during several sittings. Back in his studio, Larkin would have transferred the images to canvas while waiting for his sitters' opulent ensemble to arrive. From that point, Larkin and his apprentices would have ample time to render the detail of the costumes while they were displayed on mannequins or wooden lay models. Larkin would have been chiefly responsible for the sitters' heads and hands, while his studio assistants would have worked on repetitive details for their various specialisms, drapery, embroidery, curtains, carpets, for example, and made studio copies, much as with the studio practices of later masters like Sir Joshua Reynolds in the 18th century. Let's meet the dandies. These two peacocks are on the left, Richard Sackville, third Earl of Dorset, and on the right, his brother, Edward Sackville. Richard Sackville was a regular at court, being a close friend of the King's son, Henry, Prince of Wales. The Sackville family owned Noel House in Kent one of the largest houses in the country, which Richard Sackville mortgaged with other family properties on inheriting them. He squandered the family fortune on an extravagant lifestyle, lavish entertainment, fine clothes and heavy gambling before his early death, age 35. Contemporaries described him as one of the country's most accomplished gamblers and wastrels, a licentious spendthrift, and a little man who was willing to sacrifice self-respect for advantage. Because he did not have the courage to snarl, he took refuge in sneers. Here, Richard is dressed for the wedding of James I's daughter, Princess Elizabeth who married Frederick V, the Elector Palatine in 1613 in a spectacular ceremony to which no one below the rank of Baron was invited. Given the King's exacting standards for court dress, a royal wedding invitation was a double-edged sword and would have demanded lavish spending on the latest fashions. Richard Sackville rose to the challenge with this richly decorated classic three-piece ensemble of doublet, breeches and cloak. A style that remained fashionable until the 1660s, contrasting colours, especially black and white, with the height of male fashion in 1613. The Master of Ceremonies at the Royal Wedding later wrote that Lord Dorset dazzled the eyes of all who saw the splendour of his dress. His long-waisted doublet of cloth of silver is embroidered with honeysuckle, a symbol of betrothal or marriage, and it's padded, fitted and stiffened so as to avoid any creases, a big no-no. 
ribbons held the doublet and breeches together at the waist with overlapping flaps to cover the gaps. His full breeches were of black silk and his shoulder cloak of black velvet was lined with silk shag, a coarse rough woven silk finely rendered by laughing. His gloves with the matching embroidered gauntlets are luxury items that also denote high status. And usually the outfit is described in detail in an inventory of 1617, a rare combination of image and document. One of the unique features of Richard Larkin's painting techniques is very evident if you stand to the left of Richard Sackville's portrait looking at it from a raking angle. You'll see that the pattern details are raised from the canvas like braille. The curtain fringes, the individual black stitches on the carpet, the silver threads of his silk throat, silver and gold embroidery on his doublet breeches and stockings, and the ruffled edges of his shoe roses. Exceptionally, Larkin never used metallic gold or silver leaf. Instead, he applied triple layers of brown, orange, yellow for gold, and dark gray, light gray, white for silver, with meticulous precision. He also used traditional pigments inventively over colored underlayers to give a range of bright pinks, purples, yellows, and greens, as well as to create shades of blue, purple, lilac, and puce. The focus of Richard's coordinated accessories are his matching fashionably high-heeled shoes, decorated with rosettes or shoe roses that are trimmed with spangled metal bobbin lace. The legs of male courtiers were a particular focus of display, a fashion first favoured by Queen Elizabeth I, who appreciated gentlemen with good legs who were adept at dancing. Men whose legs were not shapely enough would insert false wooden calves into their stockings. As well as his gloves and shoes, a range of expensive accessories complete Richard's formal court ensemble. White silk stockings, embroidered to match his gloves, held up below the knee by taffeta garters, with embroidered voile hangings, beautifully rendered by Larkin or his assistant. His other accessories are a starched band or collar. Uh, this is of needle lace and it's less conservative than a ruff, these being gradually replaced during the reign of James I. And on the table beside him, a black felt hat called a capota that he would have worn at a jaunty angle to the side or back of his head. And here is Richard in Amsterdam at the Rijksmuseum in 2018 for the High Society exhibition, where he travelled in the company of Count, our Countess Howe by Gainsborough. Edward Sackville inherited the title of fourth Earl of Dorset on his brother's death. When Larkin painted this companion portrait in 1613, Edward was 24 years old, a year younger than his brother, a politician and a loyal courtier. Edward's formal court dress, which is similar to his brother's, was also worn to the wedding of Princess Elizabeth. In 1613, in the year of this portrait, Edward Sackville had killed his former friend, Lord Bruce of Kinloss, in a duel over a woman the celebrated beauty, Phoenicia Stanley. Edward lost a finger in the exchange, which had been fought in a field near Antwerp that the rivals had bought expressly, 
during being forbidden in England, while his adversary, Edward Bruce, died of his wounds. Ironically, when Edward returned to England, Venetia Stanley had married her childhood sweetheart, Canel Digby. However, gossip had it that while Digby had been abroad on his grand tour, Venetia had been the mistress not of Edward, but of Richard Sackville and had children by him. I absolutely don't know the truth of this. The miniature on her left by Isaac Oliver is in the V&A collection, where the unusual portrait of her on the right in Dulwich Picture Gallery was commissioned by her grief-stricken husband, Digby, who summoned Van Dyke to paint her on her deathbed, her peccadilloes being long overlooked. However, Edward may not have been too heartbroken by the loss, as testified by the ribbons threaded through his left earlobe, which were very fashionable trophies of romantic conquest, the steward equivalent of notches on bedposts. There are five or six. His features are not as strongly painted as Richard's and his hair, which is blonder than his brother's, is brushed away from his face with added volume similar to female fashions of the day in a Princess Anne style griffon. Closer inspection of Edward's hands in the portrait doesn't reveal a missing digit, perhaps because it was his half-hidden right hand that received the injury, or because such very similitude would have appeared unseemly, or simply because hands were painted in a standard format back in Larkin's studio in the sitter's absence. Note that his richly embroidered doublet is left open to show off a little of his linen shirt. No unfashionable ruff for him either. Instead, he sports a wide standing Italian lace collar supported on a rigid undercollar called a piccadilly with matching cuffs. Male fashions were relatively uniform during this period and fine accessories could make or break the effect of an outfit. Edward's ensemble is distinguished by saffron dyed stockings and high heeled shoes embroidered to match his doublet with very, very elaborate shoe roses. His final accessory on the table beside him is an ornately decorated turban crowned with a ridiculously ostentatious ostrich feather. Ushak rugs appear in all the full-length Suffolk portraits. They're often called Lotto carpets after the Italian artist Lorenzo Lotto, who had depicted carpets with this distinctive red and yellow design in two of his works ones in the National Gallery collection. They were recent imports from Turkey and were popular with rich Europeans as an indication of their wealth. Roy Strong noted three distinct styles of lotto carpet in Larkin's work and the Suffolk set contains three portraits with the same border, suggesting they may have been a studio prop included to enhance the sort of status. Now to the fashionistas. Unlike the Sackville brothers outfits, only one woman in the nine Larkin portraits is wearing court dress and I will end my presentation with her ensemble. The others, as here, are dressed formally for appearance in public but not at court. The Suffolk collection includes three full end portraits of the Cecil women by Larkin. Lady Elizabeth Cecil, mother, and her two younger daughters, Lady Diana and Anne Cecil.
The head and shoulders portrait of their older sister, Lady Elizabeth Cecil, that hangs between them in the upper hall is a 17th century copy after Paul Van Somo and is obviously not the wedding portrait. When James I ascended to the throne in 1603, he appointed Thomas Howard, hero of the Armada, as first Earl of Suffolk. The Howard family was one of the wealthiest and most powerful in England. Howard was one of the King's senior councillors along with Robert Cecil, first Earl of Salisbury. Howard's second wife was Catherine Knivet, whose portrait is the ninth full length by Larkin in the Suffolk collection, and Charlton Park in Wiltshire was one of her estates. Her husband built Audley End in North Essex, also an English heritage property. The marriage in 1614 of Elizabeth Cecil to, Howard's, uh, to Suffolk's second son, also named Thomas Howard, who was created first Earl of Berkshire in the same year, united the two families and created a powerful dynasty. The Sackville brothers were cousins of the groom, as you can see through their mother, Margaret Howard. Catherine Clavitt gave Charlton Park to the newlyweds for their home. Uh, and these are the full-length portraits, which I'm not going to describe in detail, of Lord Thomas Howard, which is English School, 1598, not by Larkin, and his second wife, Catherine Knivet, who was painted by Larkin in 1614. Here we see Lady Diana Cecil on the left, aged 12 or 13, and Lady Anne Cecil on the right, aged 11 or 12. Since the reign of Elizabeth I, court weddings had a long established tradition of identically attired bridesmaids. And these sisters may be wearing bridesmaids' dresses to the marriage of their older sister, Elizabeth, in 1614. The commission of these nine full length family portraits may have been occasioned by this wedding, possibly by mother of the groom, Catherine Knivet, possibly by the groom himself, or even by mother of the bride, Elizabeth Cecil, although I think that's less likely. The marriage theory, however, is contested because of the absence of the bride's wedding portrait. The sisters' cream satin dresses have long bodices with high necks, side skirts, and long hanging sleeves in the Spanish style attached at the elbow that fall over the main sleeves to reveal the silk lining. The dresses are showstoppers because of their very modern slashing. Myriads of decorative cuts cover the skirts and sleeves, made with pink and shears to create scalloped edges. You can just about see those, laboriously oversewn with gold embroidery to stop fraying. Sections of the slashes are opened and reveal expensive gold satin lining. Lady uh, Diana Cecil and Lady Anne Cecil have the same accessories. Their dresses are accessorate. The dresses are accessorized with cutwork lace ruffs and cuffs, with ropes of pearls tied to a rosette, pearl earrings, and fans with ivory handles. Both girls carry large lace-edged handkerchiefs and, like their mother, wear black thread lace bracelets on their left wrists, tied to an easily chipped and expensive enamel ring, a current fashion that protected against loss or damage and that also served to emphasize the whiteness of their skin 
as with a black band that Countess Hell is wearing in the portrait by Gainsbury on her right wrist. Diana's second portrait is in Lady Mansfield's bedroom, age 35. She is now Countess of Elgin. It hangs next to the pendant portrait of her second husband, Thomas Bruce, first Earl of Elgin, whose brother was killed by Edward Sackville in the notorious Antwerp duel. And both these portraits are by Cornelius Johnson around 1638. Lady Elizabeth Cecil, née Drury, Lady Burley, later Countess of Exeter, was mother of the three daughters, Elizabeth, Diana and Anne, and she would have been 35 years old in 1614 in this portrait. Her black dress doesn't necessarily denote mourning, as, she not, as she's not wearing a widow's cap. Black was a suitably fashionable colour for a woman of her age. It was one of the most expensive dyes for fabrics and another sign of status and prosperity. Around her right wrist are strings of pearls and a lace handkerchief is clutched in her hand which is resting on the red cushion of an X-ray chair. The chair appears in almost all the female portraits in different sizes and colours, so it may have been another of Larkin's studio props. Her pearl tiara, indicating the title of Countess, may have been added around 1623 when her husband was appointed Earl of Exeter. She's wearing several long strings of pearls, looped and knotted, tied at the shoulder, and like her daughters, a black silk strand bracelet attached to a ring on her left hand. The other lady in black in the Larkin portraits had married into the Suffolk family in 1614 at the age of 15. She is Elizabeth Howard, née Bassett. Her first husband was Henry Howard, brother of Thomas Howard, first of Berkshire. The exact date of the portrait isn't known, but it was painted sometime between 1614, the year of her marriage, and 1618. She may be in mourning for her husband who had died suddenly at table, almost three years into the marriage while still in his mid-twenties. However, she'd already borne three children, two of whom had died in infancy, so she could be wearing mourning for a recently deceased son. On the other hand, yet again, her black dress may not indicate mourning at all, since other accessories, such as a mourning veil and a headdress, are absent. The relative size of the X-ray chair emphasises how petite she is. As she stands framed by a gold fringed helmet and red curtains on another lotto rug. Her cuffs and matching ruff are made of beautiful cutwork lace. The ruff is yellow starched with saffron and frames her delicate features. Her early life is a sorry tale of poor rich girl. Following the death of her father, William Bassett, when she was two, she was made a ward of the crown so that income from the vast estate she inherited passed to them. This was disputed by her mother, who was refused guardianship. In the meantime, her wardship was sold off and passed between several prominent aristocrats, including Sir Walter Raleigh. To his 10-year-old son, she was betrothed at the age of four. This engagement was later broken off 
and Elizabeth was finally given into the custody of her mother, who had to pay an annual sum for the wardship until Elizabeth was 16. Her slim fitting dress has a blue embroidered skirt under a black overskirt with a scalloped hem which you can just about see and an unusual train scalloped as well hanging from the shoulder. She's wearing black silk stockings and pointed silk shoes with blue silk shoe roses. Lady Elizabeth Carey, née Tanfield, wrongly labelled Dorothy Carey in an inscription added in the 18th century, is included in the so-called Berkshire marriage set because her husband, Henry Carey, was a nephew of the Countess of Suffolk, Catherine of Nyberg. Elizabeth Carey was the first female author to write original drama in English and was also a talented linguist and translator. She later converted to Catholicism, which angered her husband and led to their separation. And kindly, she was described as short in stature and with a tendency to obesity. And surprisingly, perhaps, as she had 11 children in quick succession. She may be pregnant in this portrait with her right arm cradling her draped velvet gown, called a nightgown, over her stomach, although it may simply be draped to show off the elaborate gold metal embroidery. Like other women in the Larkin portraits, her hair is styled full volume behind and above her ears, crowned with a fashionable cap of gauze and lace. She has pendant pearl earrings and her head is framed by a linen collar of Italian reticella lace that would have been supported as in the portrait of Edward Sackville by an under collar of wire, rigid pasteboard or cardboard called a picadelle. A heavily embroidered white satin skirt edged with lace and sequins has been produced professionally at great expense. As it contrasts with the bodice, which is decorated with a different design and was probably made at home. Such garments were spot cleaned and bodices needed replacing more frequently than skirts. The Jacobean period was a golden age for embroidery and its popularity as with the fashion for body art or tattooing today, was due to the fact that motifs could include subjects of personal significance to the wearer, a private language of symbols. The shoes are made of white leather with white leather and wood heels, and her green silk stockings match the green spangles in the center of her large gold shoe roses. The final full-length portrait by William Larkin in the room is Lady Isabella Rich. She was a cousin of Thomas Howard, first Earl of Suffolk, and also a niece of Catherine Clivet, whose first husband was Richard Rich, Isabella's uncle. Isabella was married to Sir Henry Rich, who would be executed as a royalist in 1649. Isabella is the only woman in the Larkin portraits in court dress. She's wearing masquerade style, indicated by the red and blue mantle draped diagonally and knotted over her left shoulder. Masks were hugely popular. Court entertainments held several times a year and lasting several days. They were elaborate and costly productions that often included silent roles to be performed by noblemen and women of the court for an elite audience of their peers, combining music, dance and mime. 
with spectacular costume and moving sets. The illustration shows a mask costume designed by Inigo Jones from around 1610, with a risque, transparent bodice, the significance of which will become obvious. Courtiers could let their hair down at these celebrations, literally, in Isabella's case. Her loose blonde hair, with its coronet of pearls indicative of the rank of countess, is another element of female mask dress. Undressed hair falling loose over the shoulders was intimate, and for married women like Isabella would normally be restricted to the bedroom. Crimped hair like hers was another mask fashion. Courtly women also frequently lightened their hair in imitation of the natural blonde of Queen Anne of Denmark. They used hair bleach made from a recipe of costly ingredients like cumin seeds, saffron oil, and celandine, or if times were hard, urine was used as a bleaching agent. Another prominent mask feature is an extremely low cut bodice. Such decoltage were de rigueur at court entertainments, and the nearer the wearer was in status to the king, the lower the neckline that was permitted. In fact, the Venetian ambassador at such a court mask in 1616 noted with some surprise the liberal display of bosom. Isabella's bodice almost reveals her nipples, which would sometimes have been painted pink using cochineal mixed with egg white, as the risk of wardrobe malfunction was high. Cochineal was also used to colour cheeks and lips. Her skin, on the other hand, is glazed with white paint, a mix of egg white, borax and sulphur, or of white lead and vinegar and she enhances the effect of a translucent complexion, as was the mode, by painting the veins on her chest blue. And if you've never noticed that, when the upper hall is open, do go and have a closer look. Dressing was a complex and lengthy business for aristocratic women like Isabella. Fashionable women in this age of poor diet often suffered from sallow complexions, smallpox scars. In fact, Kathleen Knivet had smallpox in 1619 and thereafter refused ever to have a portrait painting painted and she'd been a great beauty. They also suffered from early loss of teeth through overconsumption of sugar. So they used as much artifice as was available to make the most of their public appearance. In a Ben Jonson comedy of 1609, Epicene, or The Silent Woman, one of the male characters complains of his wife, all her teeth were made in the Blackfriars, both her eyebrows in the Strand and her hair in Silver Street. She takes herself asunder when she goes to bed under some 20 boxes, and about the next day noon, is put together again like a great German clock. Like Lady Elizabeth Carey, Isabella's silk dress embroidered with flowers is a professionally fashioned skirt, but a homemade bodice. And she wears white kid leather shoes with the now familiar spangled shoe roses. Spangles with small metal discs that we now call sequins. The final element of note in Isabella's mask on song is her standing starched collar. The restriction of her collar, combined with the freedom of her neckline, is typical of the imagery of the Jacobean temptress. Her colour is dyed a fashionable pale yellow. Yellow 
was often considered a decadent color signifying base passion. And James I tried to ban it after a famous scandal involving Francis Carr, Countess of Somerset, nay, Francis Howard, daughter of Thomas Howard and Catherine Knivet. So she was aunt to the Cecil sisters and to the Cecil brothers, to the Sackville brothers, sorry. Uh, she's seen here in a portrait by Larkin's studio. It's probably a copy of a portrait by Larkin, and you can find that in the National Portrait Gallery. She'd been married at the age of 14 to the 13-year-old Robert Devereux, third Earl of Essex, but had obtained an annulment to the marriage on the grounds of non-consummation, enabling her to marry the man she'd fallen in love with, the King's favourite, Robert Carr, first Earl of Somerset. The union was opposed by Sir Thomas Overbury, a close friend and advisor of Carr's. The Howards conspired to have Overbury imprisoned in the tower and he subsequently died there. It transpired that Francis Carr had been gradually poisoning him with jellies and tarts tainted with toxins and with a poisoned enema smuggled into the tower. She eventually confessed and was imprisoned in the tower herself for some years with Carr but it was her waiting woman, mistress Anne Turner, a famous yellow starcher, wife of a London doctor, who was scapegoated for the crime and hanged at Tyburn. By the early 1620s, the vogue for yellow starch declined naturally, although the king's attempt to ban it had failed. Larkin's association with intrigue and scandal with the Howards with the disreputable Robert Sackville, and particularly with the notorious Francis Carr, may explain why royal patronage always eluded him. In conclusion, while well, half the population lived below subsistence level, the opulent flaunting of wealth of the court and aristocracy, attested by the Suffolk collection portraits, could not be sustained. A little more than two decades later, in the reign of James I's son, Charles I, their supremacy would be challenged. William Larkin's paintings were the high point of Tudor and Jacobean portraiture, but also its final chapter. He was a transitional artist in this respect, but the most innovative painter of his time by far, developing the Elizabethan tradition with the singularity of his painting techniques. At his death, the curtains would be drawn on his identity for almost four centuries. Thank you.